This is Python's Paradise. This is your host, Greg Gilbert, a.k.a. the Python Hyena, straight out of Fredericton, New Brunswick, Canada. And here we are, 10 o'clock in the morning here on January the 12th, but my guess is five hours ahead of me in France. Folks, we give you one of the lovely stars of A Clockwork Orange, which uh, just at the tail end of last year celebrated its 50th anniversary. Uh, that film came out the year before I was born. In fact, I would have been in the womb when that thing was in the theaters originally. <laughs> Folks, I give you one of the nurses, Nurse Feely herself, Carol Drinkwater. How do you do, Carol? Hi there. It really dates me to hear that you were in the womb when we were when that was even coming out. Never mind shooting it. It was my well, first out of drama school. There you go. Well, look what I get to show you. Look at that. Wow. <laughs> Wonderful T-shirt. I've got two Clockwork Orange T-shirt. I got one that's completely orange. It's got uh, the black shadows of them walking where they're through going through the tunnel there. Yeah. 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 And I tried to find it, but I have a deck of playing cards of a clockwork orange too. And like, I'm kind of in between places, you know, my brother is uh, my tech guy and my manager, but he's uh, been taking care of our folks who are both terminally ill. So uh, we were supposed to do a housing project where they live up, he and his wife live upstairs and I live downstairs um that's been put on hold so i've been just kind of here with everything kind of packed away and uh so but i do have a little deck of clockwork orange playing cards here somewhere but where did you get all this all this stuff from i that got book? i got the um the playing cards at sunrise records they just had had it in the memorabilia section and i was like wow I, you know um I wish I could have found it too. I, I know I've got it here somewhere, but <laughs> who knows? You'll uh, find it. You'll find it later. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I'll find it when the, the, it's not needed to be found. <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah, it's a little deck of playing cards, Clockwork Orange, and I don't even think I opened them if I remember correctly. But um, I just kept them sealed up. But here's the Blu-ray, of course. Oh right. Yeah. I haven't got those. I'll have to get myself one of those. Yeah, you're my second guest from this movie. I had Clive Francis on uh, back in 2018, I believe. And, um, of course, he was the lodger. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yep. Very, very nice gentleman. It was so nice to talk He's to him. Man. And He's a lovely man, yes. Indeed. Yeah. And <laughs> like, yeah. And like yourself, he grew up in the theaters. That's right. In the British theatre that we both came through sort of more or less the same system, because in England at that stage, really what you did is you went, you trained at drama school and then you went out into the repertory system, which is the theatres all around the country. Uh -huh. And you kind of cut your teeth in those. I mean, I, I got to play humongous parts at the age of 20, 22, kind of like Cleopatra, which I was much too young for. But it was a wonderful experience. And it really taught you about working with audiences. And you really got to know your trade. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons why there is a, a school of very fine British actors. Uh, it's They tend to be more the slightly older generation now, or not the youngest generation, put it that way, because of course, that um, that wonderful repertory system, does, there are still repertory theatres, but it doesn't exist in the same way as it did when I left drama school. I mean, when you're at drama school, what you were doing were you were sending out in your last year letters and letters and letters, dozens of them, to all these directors and casting directors all over England. And there was a choice of, I don't know, 150 different theatres that you could go if you got, if you got the role um, and start out at these and spend a year in each one and go around and do different parts. It was a wonderful way to, to learn your trade and to get to know how to work with audiences. Yes. And of course you worked with Mr. Sir Lawrence Olivier. Lord Olivier, Larry, I did. I was a year yeah. at the 
a little bit more than a year at the National Theatre with him. Mm-hmm. Uh, even before I went to drama school, I worked backstage at the um, at the National Theatre and um, I was working in the wardrobe. That was while I was waiting to go to drama school. Um, my job when I was working in the wardrobe, the, um, we had a very drunken wardrobe mistress, um, dear soul, I'm sure she's long since gone. Anyway, her job uh, was to make sure that when Larry was doing Othello, for which of course he was, he was blacked up, they wouldn't do it now, um, he wore this amazing white cloak, I mean, a very striking image on stage, he in all this black makeup and this white cloak, which of course got very dirty all the time because the, the makeup rubbed off on it. So every single performance they had to, you know, they had several of these cloaks. And my job, um, the wardrobe mistress gave me the job of taking it down to Larry's dressing room, the number one dressing room. So I'd knock on the door and come in and I creep in really. I mean, I was so in awe of him. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and he'd chat to me a little bit. What do you want to do? I want to be an actress. Are you going to go to drama school? Yes, yes, I'm going in September. Ah, oh, well, maybe we'll see you. And then four years later, I was back in the company. I was back there as an actress. So that was that was very wonderful. And he was very, very good to me. He spent a lot of time. He watched some of my performances and he'd come and give me notes and he'd say, why don't you try this, baby? <laughs> you know, and, and he always said, Please call me Larry. Uh, oh, used, nice! Yes, sir. I'll call you Larry. But I know I was at that stage. Never did. I was much too much too in awe of him and his greatness. He was oh, a rem- wow. remarkable. Well, but- thing. He, he played a great Zeus and Clash of the Titans, you know, and uh, and I loved him as the villain in Marathon Man, you know. Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. He was he was wonderful in that. Absolutely. No, I had to bring that up because I was doing some research on you and um, that would have been incredible, you know. Um, you, you, you're you in France right now. What's it like in France right now? I've never been there. Oh, it's beautiful. It's a wonderful country. You must come and visit us as soon as all this pandemic nonsense is behind us. Yeah. It will be this year, please God. Um, oh, please, yeah. Over, yes, I mean, um, I, I've just completed before Christmas uh, a series called Carol Drinkwater Secret Provence, mm-hmm. which goes out on Channel 5 in England. It's a UK terrestrial channel. Um, and they've got it on their catch-up, or it, I think it's also on YouTube. So do tell your, your listeners to watch out for that, and you watch out for it. And then you will see, I, in six episodes, I take people around Provence, and where I have been inspired for my novels or, or, or my books about work, you know, living on an olive farm. And so there's, there's a, a lot of material in there, which you'd love. And it will show you a little bit of the very beautiful countryside. And we have 300 olive, more than 300 olive trees on our land. And we farm those, we make olive oil, etc. So all that is in the series. So it's worth having a, having a look and seeing that if you can. Absolutely. Well, I live in New Brunswick, Canada, so uh, I'm five hours behind you. I don't know. A lot of people think that uh, like New York is one hour behind me, you know. Have you ever been out the New Brunswick way before in Canada? No, I've been <laughs> Toronto's about as far as I've been. I love I've been Toronto. <laughs> I love Toronto too. Mm-hmm. I really do love Toronto. I've only been there twice. I went there once to write an article for an English magazine. Mm-hmm. And I also was there once with my husband at Christmas. And it was joyous. It was absolutely beautiful. And it was snowing. I mean, it was kind of, you know, the real. And we just come, we flew, we'd flown in from Sydney, midsummer Sydney. Uh, okay. <clears throat> where I'd been filming and I finished filming and we got on a plane and before we came back to France we went to I think Michelle had some meetings there we went to Toronto and so it was just Christmas Eve and it was just glorious it was magical and I fell in love with it straight away so when I was invited to go there uh, to write an article for a week um, for one of the English um, Sunday newspaper magazines I loved it I, I jumped at the opportunity to go to go back um, I'd like to spend more time. I mean, I really don't know Canada at all. And I've got some very good Canadian friends. So mm-hmm. it would be fantastic to come and spend more time there. Tell me about New Brunswick. New Brunswick. Well, right now we're really cold here because uh, our uh, winters are pretty cold. In fact, yesterday, yesterday I woke up shivering, you know, and I, mm-hmm. I'd done a speaking of 50th anniversaries. I interviewed Ellen Gear from 
uh, Harold and Maude yesterday, 50th anniversary of that film. And I woke up shivering in a ball and, and um, I was like, well, I'm going to solve that problem. I made an investment, went and got my, went to Canadian Tire and got myself uh, an electric blanket. I'll tell you, I feel a lot better this morning. <laughs> electric blankets, that's something of the past in my life, something I remember when my mum was alive. And she always, if I came to visit her, she always said, I put the electric blanket on because I know you'll be cold. <laughs> yeah. I'm from the south of France, yeah. Yeah, it's my first time having one, but I'm I'm in a basement apartment, so oh. uh, it's a little oh, colder. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, waiting to move. Yeah, waiting to move. So, uh, so yeah, I slept a lot better last night. I'll tell you that, and uh, so delighted. I couldn't wait to get on here and and talk to you today. And uh, you might be my first guest from France too. If I I know I've yeah. interviewed yeah. people from the UK, uh, but. I don't think I've interviewed anybody from France before, so because uh, you're the f a five hour time difference from me, so that's that's really interesting. So, but um, but yeah, a Clockwork Orange. I remember doing my first convention in Toronto because I've lived here. I'm going to be fifty this year, so um, and I've lived here my whole life. But it wasn't until 2017 that I actually left New Brunswick for the first time. And one of my guests had invited me to Toronto to a horror film convention and I to assist her at her table. And I could not say no to that. Yeah. And uh, I'm the only one in my family who's been in a plane. And uh, good Lord. And, yeah. And I have to admit, it felt like a bus in the sky. I actually didn't mind it. And uh, but I have a little story about Clockwork Orange at that con because uh, I was wearing this shirt that I showed you earlier. And uh, when I was um, walking around the con for a bit, I was um, addressed by a woman dressed as a demented clown. And she said, <laughs> I love your T-shirt. And I said, thanks. She rolled her sleeve up and she had this tattooed on her arm. Oh, right. <laughs> Good Lord. Yeah. <laughs> So and she it, loved the one too. Yeah. <laughs> and it was pretty cool because it was such a welcoming uh, community there, you know? And, uh, but I, Clockwork Orange was also the second movie I seen at a midnight screening. Uh, 1996, I saw Hitchcock's uh, Psycho was the first film I saw at a midnight screening here in Fredericton. And that was, um, I think, March that year. And then in August that year, I got to attend a midnight screening of a clockwork orange and it was packed and uh, it was nice yeah. to see this on the big screen, you know, uh, pretty cool. It's a very good film. I mean, way ahead of its time, way ahead of its oh, time. Yeah. It was Canada, I think was one of the France and Canada were two of the only countries that throughout um, all these years, because it was he, uh, Stanley banned it in Britain. He banned the film. So it didn't play in Britain after its uh, uh, first year screenings, I think until after he died. And it was his family who lifted the ban on the film. But um, it played consistently in Paris. There was one very small cinema on the left bank that I used to walk past quite regularly, which always had a Clockwork Orange uh, screening. Throughout those 50 years, a Clockwork Orange was always playing in Paris, which is quite remarkable. And I think, and I seem to remember that I read somewhere that also in Canada, it played fairly consistently. Is that so? Oh, oh yeah, it plays. <laughs> Actually, when I was in Toronto, I didn't see it in Toronto, but I know it was on the listings of all their various theaters. So a Clockwork Orange is usually playing somewhere, you know. Yeah. And this wouldn't be the first controversy for Kubrick, because I remember Lolita was also a, a controversial okay. film, too, uh, about nine years prior to it. But uh, But it's funny, because... In 1971, A Clockwork Orange, Straw Dogs, Dirty Harry, they were all banned in various places because of uh, their subject matter. But yet, 30 years later, a movie by Tom Green called Freddy Got Finger gets an R rating when that should have been given an X rating. It's weird the stuff that's even played on television today. Mm. 
you know. I don't know that film, uh, Freddy the Freddy the Finger. Trust me, you didn't miss anything. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's 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 pretty disgusting. Okay, oh, well yeah. that wouldn't. Be- I don't think, no. No, I think, uh, I mean, the thing about A Clockwork Orange is that it is actually a visionary film. It is ahead of its time. Oh, yes, it uh, is, yeah. What, um, what Stanley was um, trying to show through and through Anthony Burgess' uh, novel is something that we see quite a lot of in, in a different way now, you know. I mean, okay, it's not droogs and things, but, um, you know, sometimes you hear stories of what's going on in the streets and I think to myself man that's that's a clockwork orange right there you know yeah so I think it was I think it's a great pity that he felt it was necessary I mean he got the the reviews quite um were very very unkind to him and he was a visionary man I I think I mean it's interesting you mentioned Lolita I mean I, I the question has come up several times recently especially as I was part of the Me Too movement um, in Britain uh, you know would you get to make Lolita now I mean if let's say Steven Spielberg who's just done a remake a rather wonderful remake of of West Side Story imagine he said I'm going to do Lolita I wonder what the reaction would be to even someone of that of that weight and that um you know, artistic clout, would they get away with making a film like that now? I don't know. I don't know. I mean, obviously it would depend on their take on it, but um, that was a film way ahead of its time. And I think it took great courage to make that film. And indeed, of course, the controversy. Yeah. But uh, Kubrick had a great filmography, you know, uh, Spartacus, Dr. Strangelove, 2001, A Space Odyssey, uh, the Shining, Full Metal Jacket, and uh, I did attend uh, Eyes Wide Shut when I when that appeared in theaters, and I enjoyed that very, very much. In fact, I interviewed somebody from that film as well. So, um, but Funny enough, was... I didn't like when I saw Eyes Wide Shut. The I saw it when it first came out in the cinema, and I didn't like it. And I watched it again recently, and I did like it. I thought, oh, actually, I don't think I really got the full impact of that. There was also Marisa, the one with Marisa Berenson. Um, oh, oh, I can't think of the title of it now, which I watched again and thought was a, thought was a rather fine film. So I think, you know, his work definitely um, calls to be looked at again in different periods and with the changes that are happening in our modern society. You can go back to Kubrick and there will always be something in there to see that in fact is relevant to what's going on at this particular stage in our in our development, I think our evolution, social evolution. <clears throat> yeah, talk about being cast as uh, Nurse Feely. What was your reaction to uh, the script and to the role? Well, let's be honest. I mean, it it was originally four lines, and then because they got so far behind with the shout uh, with the shooting, because Malcolm McDowell got ill, uh, it became two lines. So it's hardly a starring role. It was very kind of you to say <laughs> it's a starring role. What happened was the day after I left drama school, um, I'd been offered a couple of things from the you know the screening, you know the the uh, the, the showings that we had. We had plays that casting directors and things came to see us in and I was offered a couple of um, theatre jobs but they didn't start immediately after leaving drama school and the day after I left drama school my father had a theatrical agency in in Kent I went to answer the telephone for him and earn earn a few shillings while I was waiting to get some work and the telephone rang and um, this uh, this uh, American voice said uh, you know could we speak to Carol Drinkwater please and I said, it's Carol Drinkwater speaking. And they said, uh, this lady said, I'm Stanley Kubrick's assistant. And there was a pause. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was one of the other girls from drama school, um, you know, winding me up. And I said, come on, Selena or Judy or whoever it was. Come on. She said, uh, there was a kind of pose <laughs> silence. And she said, this is Stanley Kubrick's assistant. Um, did you say that is Carol Drinkwater? And I said, yes, it is. And I thought I better take this point. She said, we want to know, Stanley wants to know, would you like to come and screen test for him? I just thought this is just improbable. I left drama school yesterday. How can he, he'd seen my photograph in Spotlight, I think, and the casting director had seen me in one of my, you know, end of year 
performances at drama school and said, oh, you know, she's good or something. So Stanley said, well, let's get her in, you know, let's get her in for a screen test. So I went along for the screen test and I had to do a piece, um, a Marilyn Monroe piece from Some Like It Hot. I love and that I, film. I love that film. <laughs> that... Marilyn Monroe is one of my heroines. So, you know, I thought this is just too surreal. Stanley Kubrick, Marilyn Monroe, and I'm not even a week out of drama school. I had these, you know, it was the hippie times. I had these big dangling earrings on, which kind of rang like bells, you know, which of course is now I know it's not a very sensible thing to wear for a screen test. But anyway, I did. And I was just laughing because I thought this is not serious. And I think I came across as so light and, you know, anyway, I got the role um, and they said, um, I didn't even have an agent at that stage. They said, okay, uh, Stanley, would he loved your screen test. <laughs> He'd love you to come and work with us. Um, he, we're sending you through the script. And of course, I thought it would be more than that, but it was four lines. And I, and I said, oh, it's only four lines. And they said, this is Stanley Kubrick. So I said, okay, yes, great. So um, they booked me for one day because they were going to do it all in one day. Um, and I think I was paid a hundred pounds, which for me was an enormous amount of money back then. Enormous, it was a, an entire terms grant or something for me. And because they got so far behind on the shooting, they had to cancel my day and rebook me, I think, three times. So I ended up getting something like £300 for these two lines, as it turned out to be in the end, um, which seemed like I, it felt like I'd you know, gone to Hollywood. <laughs> um, and on the day I was called out, we did it in a place called Milton Keynes, which back then was a new town. And we were in a hospital. And I sat in my nurse's uniform all day, trying not to get it creased. And, um, and I was doing voiceover, my exercises and all that kind of thing. And other actors were looking at me like, you know, poor new thing. And about seven o'clock in the evening, someone said, Carol, drink water. And I said, yes, that's me. They said, Stanley wants you. So I was called to um, this soundstage or where they'd set up this this hospital ward and Stanley said hi I'm Stanley and I just want to tell you and he talked to me about what the film was about what my role would what he wanted to get from my role he went into great detail he was extremely um, meticulous about what he told me he was a perfectionist about the way he approached it everybody I spoke to on the set every crew member and I trust me now after my years in the business this is very rare everybody on the set said that he could do their job better than they did and that is quite a remarkable that is coming from you know serious technicians high quality technicians who all had the greatest respect for him anyway when we came to do the scene he said okay get the costume off and I said what do you mean of course nowadays you wouldn't get away with this and he said you know I want you naked and I went what <laughs> <laughs> no one that. Uh, I, I sat there and I was kind of clinging to the nurse's apron on me in case he, and he said no the idea is you've just been making love with this doctor and you know Malcolm calls you and you're caught disarray and blah 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 so I said to him well look can we have a compromise how about I it's like the doctor has just torn my top off but I've still got my stiff collar and my calf he said that's a great idea let's go with that so I got to be not as naked as I as I originally feared I would. He was very good. He said, you want me to clear the set? I didn't even know what that meant, you know? And, and so he said, what I mean is we just keep the, the key uh, crew with us, obviously the cameraman and sound man and thing, but everybody else goes so that it's private. He was just so considerate, so meticulous. I, it was a real, a real, of course, because it was my first job, literally my first job, after drama school and certainly my first camera work, I didn't appreciate, of course, how wonderful he was and how extremely technically top of the top of the game he was because I had no one to compare it to. It was only later as I began to work with other people, I thought, my God, I really see why Stanley is where he is, you know. So it was a it was a of course, I didn't know that it was going to be uh, the cult film or the classic film that it turned out to be. Uh, nor did I know that wherever I went, people would say to me, you're starring role in The Clockwork Orange. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's something um, that's lived, I've lived with and I'm extremely proud to have lived with, you know. 
I got to admit, you you uh, um, appearing out uh, from behind that curtain uh, with your top ripped open and the guy's got his pants zipped down was kind of comical, you know? That's exactly what he said he wanted. So when I suggested the, the cuffs, and he said, that's terrific, because he wanted it to have a kind of a, a, a sense of the ridiculous, you know, which is what makes the film so fantastic, is that it's, it has such, a, such an acute sense of horror and ridiculousness. You know, I mean, he, he, he walks those, those two sharp edges brilliantly. And the yeah. whole movie moves very, very adroitly between a kind of lunacy, a kind of laughing lunacy and a horror, which also makes you want to kind of laugh with fear. You know what I mean? He very, very um, masterfully finds a way to uh, move you, the audience and, the, and the, the script and the screen images from one to the other without you even knowing that you're skipping from one to the other. I, I think that's fair enough to say. Don't you agree? Yep, I agree. Well, you you did get uh, away easy because, uh, you know, Adrian Corey and uh, oh. I'm trying to find the other uh, actress, Virginia Bates, is it? Ginny Bates? Um, she would have been Ralph Bates' wife, would she? The late one yeah. for Ralph Bates? Yeah. No, yeah, she was she... an actress. She then had a shop. I didn't know she was an actress. Oh, okay, right. Yeah, Virginia Bates, maybe, yes. Yeah. Yeah, she went by a different. Uh, she went by a different name in the, the film, though. I'm just looking it up here, but she was the one that was uh, completely naked when when he was getting doing the whole reform thing when he was on that stage. Ah, okay, right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I did get away with it lightly when I saw the film. I thought, goodness me, yes. <laughs> yeah, Virginia uh, Weatherall, as she was called in the film. Yep, and and she was she was Virginia Bates, was she? Ralph Bates' wife. Um. You yes. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yep. From nineteen seventy three to nineteen ninety one, when he died. Yeah. I, I yeah. worked with him. I worked with him on a television. I can't remember what it was now. Wonderful man, Ralph Bates. I was a little bit in love with him, but he had very beautiful Virginia, so he, his eyes were not turned by anybody. Not that I tried or anything, but I, he was a, a, a very stunning man. Yeah, died much. Yeah. This yeah. So uh, talk about um, working with Malcolm McDowell. Well, I had very little to do with Malcolm, really. I mean, um, he was kind of strapped up in the bed. And really, I mean, I, I have no real stories to tell about him. I've never met him since. Mm -hmm. um, I would love to meet him. Um, but we had really very little exchange. All my exchange really was with was with uh, Stanley and, and the immediate members of the crew. And Malcolm just lay in the bed. And I, as we did it, I popped in and out and was at the bed and then out again. And, and that was it. I never really, and, and then after I was wrapped, um, I think he was still in the bed. <laughs> he did it, he ill. So, um, and I read somewhere not so long ago that he found it a very, very hard shoot. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. You've never tried to interview him. You know what? I would love to get him on here. You know, I um, that could be a hard catch for me, but uh, I do know he has done a lot of the cons. So uh, um, I, I'll try. I'll certainly try. I know he's yeah. been a, very busy in a lot of movies, you know, mm -hmm. and yet yeah. this is the one he's going to be most remembered for is playing mm -hmm. Alex. Yeah. Yeah. Clockwork Orange. I, d I did get Clive Francis on, so um, I, I was happy to get a couple of you from this film. It's it's um, it's like touching the movie when I have you folks on from the movie. It's like, you know, it makes the viewing experience a little more interesting. It's like mm -hmm. I talk to these people, you know, and uh, I know Clive was very, very nice and <laughs> Uh, talking about uh, that, <laughs> that sweater he was wearing <laughs> that scene, you know, but um, no, I, I, this is a great movie. Um, I got another t-shirt for A Clockwork Orange just right there in the drawer. You want me to show it to you? Oh, yes, please. <laughs> you just give me a second. I'm going to show it to you. Okay, fantastic.
Sorry for the pause. Okay. But I get a nice oh, that, that bright or orange. That is seriously orange. Oh, that's fabulous. Look at that. Oh, that fabulous. Yeah. Did you get that also at one of these um, yep. memorabilia places? Yeah, I got it at a record store, actually, and they, they sell T-shirts. That's where I got the cards, too, which I, I can't seem to find. Uh, they're packed away in a box here somewhere, but... Well, you certainly won't get wrong over at night if you're wearing that T-shirt, will you? <laughs> actually, another thing I have here, too, and it's packed away in a box, and I just thought of it now. I have a, um, a Clockwork Orange um, figurine that I got at... Uh, uh, the Toronto Comic Con. It's in a box, and it's of uh, Alex. Ah. Oh. Yep. Wow. Yeah. yeah, it's packed away here somewhere, you know, but I just thought about that, and I still have it in its box, you know. One of the things I plan to do whenever I get um, in my new place is I, well, I use these kind of as background, you know, and uh, fest up my background, and mm. yep, but... Uh, yeah, these T-shirts, I know know exactly where they are, so uh, e easy find there. <laughs> you wear them, do you, regularly? Or... Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Um, I wear them, especially when I go to cons, you know. Um, yeah. Yep, I, I, I'll uh, wear the T-shirts, so, uh, yeah. So, when A Clockwork Orange is released, uh, what do you remember about the controversy at that time? Um, I couldn't go. I was invited to the premiere and I couldn't go because by then I was in repertory theatre in England or in mm -hmm. Scotland. In fact. Um, so I went to see it on my own with my, took my mum and she was very shocked. <laughs> my Irish Catholic mum, she was very shocked. Um, yes, I remember the controversy and I was taken aback really because I thought well because I thought it was such an amazing film um of course I didn't have a sense of quite how visionary it was though mm -hmm. I, I thought it was a very startling film um and I was very proud to be in it uh so I was terribly disappointed that that I thought that um that though that some people recognized its brilliance but people were on the whole I thought rather downbeat about it and I was I was I was just disappointed really that that he came to the stage where he felt that he had to um take it off the market you know take it out of circulation yeah so, but then I was so busy going on and doing other things I mean you know as I say I was at the very beginning of my career so like any young hungry actress you know you're on to the next thing rather than the last thing so you know, I, I I moved on and didn't think about it anymore. I sort of sort of vaguely followed what was going on, but I, I just sort of felt I kept in touch with him. He and I wrote to each other. Um, I, I've still got the letters, God knows where. But um, he always, I, let's say, I wrote to him, and he always wrote back. He usually wrote on my letter, a, a note on my letter, all handwritten. Um, so I was, I did keep in touch with him. So I was kind of. Um, involved in what was going on in that sense but you know like every young actress I was looking for the next job looking to pay the electricity bill etc you know so I didn't really get myself involved in the controversy but I think it's sad that for all those years and for, and for more than for two generations people didn't get to see the film in in Britain you know I mean I think you miss out on the masterpiece yeah I agree yep yeah it's an interesting film to see with an audience that's for sure yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't think I've ever seen, I mean, I've got it at home, but I don't think that um, I've ever sat and watched it uh, on my own or in the house. I've only seen it in the cinema. And that was way back then, you know. Mm -hmm. and yes, and it was, I do, what I do remember is how vocal the audience were, which is not always the case in, in, in movies. People can be, you know, very hushed. And, but it, it, it constantly um, invoked or evoked, um, gasps or cries or I mean the audience were very physically actively involved with it and that's actually quite unusual I mean I hadn't thought about it till now but I do remember that I remember for example when I came out I remember I got a round of applause from this audience in whatever little town I was in with my mum in in Kent you know there was a round of applause people didn't know I was in the audience I mean it wasn't for me it was for the film 
Um, and, you know, throughout the film, there were cries and calls and that almost like a panto, you know, when people go to pantomime and they call out and that's part of the audience participation. But you don't necessarily expect it in the cinema, whereas that film definitely invoked it, you know, it definitely call, um, called for those kind of reactions and got them. What was your mom's reaction to your scene? <laughs> Sinful. <laughs> she, said, she said, is this the way you're going? Is this what means? She said, it's a bit sinful. <laughs> she mind later along the line. It wasn't the last time I was stripped off. So, you know, getting one bit off. No, no, no. Yes, I think she was a bit shocked by the film, generally speaking. You know, it was a bit not quite her cup of tea. Do you still get recognized for Clockwork Orange, like uh, like uh, out in the street or whatever? Are you kidding? It's 50 years ago. <laughs> Not at all. I'm hardly recognized for Helen Harriet in All Creatures Great and Small, which was the mm -hmm. thing that most people stopped me for. Um, now, of course, with the new TV, this news, um, Secret Provence TV series and for my writing. People stop me for that, but mm -hmm. uh, not for something 50 years ago. You know. Who's that little old lady hobbling along? <laughs> One other film I wanted to ask you about is The Shout. Talk oh. about your experiences on that. Oh, I loved making that film. I had because of course I knew a bit a little bit more by then. And I had I was working with John, the wonderful John Hurt. Yeah. I loved very much. I love John Hurt and Alan. Uh -huh. Alan. Alan, who had seen me in one of my last showings at drama school and had actually come back after the uh, to say how much he'd enjoyed what I'd done. And I think actually did suggest me for a couple of things. Not not, not the shout. I don't think that came through Alan. But so I got and Jerzy Skolomowski, the director, who I love. Uh, I think he's an extraordinary, again, another brave um, maverick of a director. And I like people like that very much. Um, and we had great fun making it. I mean, down in down in Devon, it was a lovely summer, you know, the location was fantastic. We were, we got on very well. Um, uh, and I think that's a remarkable film too, a, a very extraordinary, remarkable film. Again, my part was small, but um, perhaps a little bit more than A Clockwork Orange, but um, no, I was working with giants there, you know, again, because um, in, in A Clockwork Orange, I was pretty much, as I say, pretty much on my own. I kind of shot to Malcolm's bedside and back again, but I, I had no real um, actors around me that I was working with, just Malcolm, who was kind of sort of semi-unconscious. <laughs> but in The Shout, uh, because I was on location for six weeks or seven weeks or something in Devon, <clears throat> Um, I got to spend a lot of time with Alan and John and, uh, and Susan Hampshire and, you know, not so, uh, Susanna York um, and, and, and Yerji Skolomowski. I mean, the four of us spent quite a lot of time together. And there were other people in the cast, like Julian Huff, who, who has long since died now. I was at drama school with him. So there were other people around. It was a very special and very creative experience and energy in, in Devon at that time. Well, that was good. Ted Hughes came. I think he was living down there or staying down there. And he came and I knew Ted Hughes because Peter Brook had invited me to go and work with his company in Paris just mm -hmm. after I left drama school. And Ted was there and I spent, a, in fact, I didn't stay to work with them, but Ted, uh, Ted was there for the week that I was there. And so Ted and I spent quite a lot of time together, which was remarkable for me because he's an amazing poet. And he turned up again in Devon. So I got to have some lovely walk, walks on the beach with Ted Hughes, which is not something everybody can say every day. So it was a very remarkable time, and and I think an extraordinary, cre extraordinarily creative film. Yeah, and that was the year before John Hurt uh, did Alien. <laughs> was it? I, yes, I don't. Yep. Know. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, you've done a lot of television, you know, yeah. like all yeah. creatures, great and small, and and uh, chalky, and uh, I did uh, those after that. That was yeah. I, all creatures. I started, in fact, I auditioned for, uh, for or oh, I didn't audition. I went to meet them for all, all Creatures while I was shooting The Shout. I came up from Devon to see the BBC for um, All Creatures. And that was exactly the same summer. It all happened that same summer. Mm -hmm. um, and then Chalky, I think, was after. Yes, it was in between several of the All Creatures uh, series that I did Chalky. It was a lovely Jimmy Hazeldean, who also died very young. Mm -hmm. um, wonderful actor. 
And yeah. of course, you were in an awfully big adventure. You, what was it that you know? You got Hugh Grant. You got Alan Rickman, who we sadly lost uh, not too many years ago. You know. Um, yeah, that was a shocking loss. I mean, most unexpected, really. Mm -hmm. um, very, very kind human being, Alan Rickman was. Very good to his fellow actors. If they were mm -hmm. having a hard time, he would help. He was a good man, Alan Rickman. You know, I mean, why do the good ones have to go? It's yeah. Kind of when Alan, Alan was taken. Um, yeah, Hugh Grant is great. Great fun. Lovely man. Generous. Um, has a, a great sense of ethics and, and humor. I'm very fond of Hugh Grant. Yeah. There were some great, some wonderful actors in that film. Mm -hmm. And I love working with Mike Newell. Fine yeah. director. Fine director. Very fine director. Yeah. And of course, um, you have been, uh, let me go back here. Um, you've been married to, uh, Michael Newell since 1988, according to Wikipedia. What is your uh, advice to people for a long marriage? Uh, travel. <laughs> travel <laughs> in different directions and then come back and you've got something to say to each other. Yeah, we, uh, Michelle, his name is Michelle. Rather oh, than Michelle, Michael. I'm sorry. Just okay. Um, no, we, um, we were married in 88. We did split up for a while, so I... I let me front up on that. We did have, I think, four, four or something years apart and then came back together again. So um, I think um, so now we've been together about it's about 35 years, I think. Uh, we both have our own interests. We both have our own jobs. Uh, we respect each other's work immensely. Um, but we do allow each other, you know, we have a lot of freedom in the sense that we both, if we have jobs to do, can go off. I mean, it's not a question of always being together all the time. And I think that's important so that we both um, grow our own lives as well as our joint life. That's kind of pretty important for both of us. And we love each other. I mean, it's, I think it's a, a love that has matured over the years. I think we, I think after we split up and got back together again, I think that we both realized what we actually have. Um, and I think that that has matured and, and grown over the years. And I would say that we are more in love now than we were when we first met. That is awesome. That is awesome. So um, which do you prefer, acting on the stage or acting on screen? I bet acting on the stage is more challenging because you don't uh, you can't yell cut, you know. I much prefer the screen. Um, <clears throat> and of course, uh, you know, um, not because I think it's less challenging, because I don't actually think that's true. Okay. I think, uh, no, I think that on stage, um, well, you have a, a, a period of rehearsal, so you have time to really get to know your fellow performers and your role. Um, and then you take it out in front of an audience and you try it out in front of an audience before you actually get to the first night. So you get a lot of preparation time. And then, and then the real challenge is constantly <clears throat> recreating the originality of what you've created in the first place because you're repeating it all the time every day you're doing the same and sometimes that's for six months nine months you know which is an awfully long time to keep something fresh and alive yeah okay yeah that, that i would say is the real challenge of working on stage what i love about working on screen is the spontaneity you don't get four weeks rehearsal you don't necessarily you might be doing a bed scene with someone you a love scene bed scene with someone you only met the day before Mm -hmm. So you have to you have to be on your toes. I mean, you have to be on your toes in the theater, too, but in a different way yeah, on screen. You know, you have to take what's coming right there and then and deal with it. And in the theater, uh, that also happens if somebody in the audience stands up and shouts drunkenly. You have to deal with that, too. But on in on film, you might be out of doors. You might have like if you're doing all creatures, great and small, you might have a, a cow that runs. I had a, a cow that peed all over my back and my. Oh. Yeah. And because we not because it wasn't a big budget and we didn't have changes of costumes and all that sort of thing, doubles, I had to spend the whole day in that costume. So, <clears throat> you know, you have to adapt to, I mean, they, they sprayed me and tried to clean me up and everything, but it, it was a pretty <laughs> uncomfortable day. 
<laughs> I bet. <laughs> Very well indeed. So you constantly have to be on your toes. You might be working with someone who doesn't necessarily give back when it's not there. You know, when they're not on screen, some people aren't necessarily as generous as when they're on screen for their own shot. Mm-hmm. You know, there's all kinds of things that you have to um, you have to negotiate. But I think the thing I love most about working on screen is that you've got you're very much in contact with crew and cast. It's an ensemble of technical and and um, artistic and creative. I mean, you're all creative, but different kinds of creativity. And I love that. I love the fact that there's camera people there, there's makeup people, there. all those people, all part of the the gypsy caravan that you move with as you go along between you know one day and the next. And I love that. I mean, I have a bit of gypsy in me from my Irish background. So I love that very much. Um, And I love the fact that when you start out on a production, uh, you are a lot of disparate people. But by the end of it, you have kind of in some way uh, um, come together and and turned into some kind of um, almost like an animal, you know, uh, that is of its own making. You know, you are one big uh, creative personality you know and I love that too I love the fact that every single person on the set has something to contribute to what the nature of that team that equipe is about I find that very exhilarating yes absolutely you have to be generous too with that you know Mm -hmm. people that are selfish it shows very much um, I would love for you to plug your uh, web page on here, you know, because uh, I found that. And uh, you want to plug that and talk about that a bit here? Uh, www.caroldrinkwater.com. Very simple. Uh, yeah, on there I have all my books. Um, I write a, a blog about once a month if I have time to do so. I send out a newsletter seasonal so no, normally about four a year so you can you can sign up for that mm-hmm. um i uh, there's a page for saving bees which is one of my big i'm very much into uh, the environment mm-hmm. um and, and looking after the environment and saving the environment there's a lot about our olive farm where we live in the south of france mm-hmm. um <clears throat> there's a page about my acting there's ways to get hold of me there is also a bit about our cottage that we have on the land which is for holiday rent it's not a available at the moment due to the pandemic and everything so that's off it's there but it's off the market at the moment um lots about what i'm doing interviews that i've done with people i mean for example we can put this up there absolutely um, you know so you can let me have the link later and we can stick that up there as well absolutely. so people can, you can trawl around and find all kinds of photographs from some of my travels or you know um, availability of how you can buy some of the um, documentaries that I've been involved in making. Um, you know, all this a whole load of stuff on, on there. There's enough to keep you busy for a couple of days if you go on there. Yeah. And uh, I, you kind of touched upon my next question. I was, uh, with that answer, um, I was going to ask if you had charities that you would like to promote on here. Charities? And you mentioned yes, I, you know, the environment. Well, I do. Yes, I'm very much involved in all kind of bee issues because I think that we are, uh, if we let go of the honeybee or indeed all pollinators, then we really are in big trouble. So I'm, I, I fight, I've been fighting and screaming and shouting about the bees since the late 90s when nobody was really paying any attention to that or was alerted to what was going on. Mm-hmm. So I'm always looking for environmental issues that... Um, uh, that are close to my heart in terms of charities actually um well there's something called defa uk which is an english charity about a a small it's a, just a northern english plumber and he's out there putting for disabled and elderly people and those impoverished which is a big issue in england at the moment mm-hmm. um he does free he puts in free heaters in the winter um You know, you probably wouldn't have had, well, you're not disabled or old, but, you know, a basement flat that's in need of heating, he would go in and help, no charge, you know. So, and funny enough, I I learned about that, him, through Hugh Grant. Oh. Yeah, Hugh supports them, and that's how I got to hear about them. So I've been doing quite a bit for that. I've been selling books on Twitter. Um, Well, not selling the books. I've been offering books for, if they made a donation to this this particular you know he's a he's an ordinary man running his own plumbing business 
trying to do something about what's happening in England, which is a bit worrying. So, um, you know, little charities like that I like to help out with. I, I'm very much involved in, in reading issues for children. I think it's mm -hmm. important to help. That, that's one of the reasons why I've been giving him books so that, you know, he gives birthday presents to kids whose parents can't afford to um, buy presents because they're out of work or whatever the problem is. Um, and so I've been sending books to him because I, I, I've written quite a few books for the young adult market through Scholastic. So I've been sending him copies of those books that he can put in the birthday present bag so mm -hmm. that the children don't just have things. They actually, if they have they have books, it gives them an opportunity to start to read, to begin to question, to begin to see the world, to begin to move into imaginative worlds. Um, and I think it's very important to encourage young people, no matter what their reading skills are, to start to enjoy reading and, and begin to question the world for themselves. So um, I'm involved in that. Um, and also I'm um, one of my other big things is the refugees. I am. Um, I feel very strongly about what's happening in Europe at the moment. Um, one or two countries are carrying the, you know, carrying the can for other countries that aren't really being very supportive in Europe. Um, and there are one or two areas in, in, in Europe and um, just outside Europe, Turkey as well, where the refugee um, situation, the Mediterranean, where people are, are dying in boats um, <clears throat> because they're trying to escape for a better life. Uh, so I'm I'm quite involved in that as well. That is something that's extremely important to me. So they're the things I care about, really. And my dogs and my husband and our olive trees. <laughs> yep, absolutely, absolutely. And, of course, you mentioned your writing. Uh, anything uh, uh, you got coming up for your writing that you want to um, promote on here? Well, my latest novel, which came out um, last year now, 2000, it came out during 2021, is called An Act of Love, which interestingly actually is the story of a 17-year-old girl and her parents, but it's mainly her story. In the set in, during the Second World War in the south of France, not far from, it's based on a true story, inspired by a true story, of a village in the south of France, uh, an hour behind Nice, that agreed when, when the Nazis breached um, the free zone, which, or the whole of the south of France was free zone, when they breached that and Hitler got them crossing over into the free zone, and it was clear that they were going to make their way all the way to, towards Italy, all the Jewish refugees or any refugees down there suddenly became endangered. And this village, which is about an hour from um, Nice in the hills towards the lower Alps, voted unanimously to take in refugees. And um, by 1943, they were only there for eight or nine months because then the Nazis came. By um, February, March, 1943, the village, which was between five and 600 inhabitants, was suddenly more than 1,200 inhabitants because they had doubled their figure by including refugees. And there became this extraordinary situation for eight months where mainly Jews, refugees, were living in this village. They were paying their rent if they could um, and contributing. And they started things like piano clubs and chess clubs and meeting with the locals. And this very extraordinary and unusual social situation was created via the generosity of the local people <clears throat> and the need of the refugees who, who came from all over Europe, Eastern Europe, Russia, all these different languages were being spoken. They were learning French. The others might be learning one of their. And this it's the story of the 17 year old girl who is at the, on the brink of womanhood. Her life is about to begin. And yet there she is in this war situation, which is unreal in some ways because the war hasn't yet reached this village, but it's getting closer throughout the book. Um, and it's the story of the 17 year old girl. So it's a refugee story, but not a modern one, but I got the idea when I actually spent time um, watching a Syrian family trying to get into Europe and into Germany. And there was a young girl, they had a young daughter, and I, a teenage daughter, and I was watching her and I started to ask myself all the questions about what this girl must be feeling. You know, her life has been disrupted. You know, she there's no chance for her to meet friends of her. She can't fall in love. All those kind of things, you know, all those questions came up for me. And that was really the seed for the book. And I didn't think my publishers would want a Syrian um, refugee story. So I decided to set it based and inspired by this real story. And um, it's been huge, very, very well received. 
wonderful review. So it's called An Act of Love. An Act of Love. Well, you know what? I enjoyed so much. What an honor having you come on here today and speak with me. Uh, you know, I um, what an honor it was uh, to have you on here, the 50th anniversary of A Clockwork Orange. And, of course, I'll show these T-shirts off for you again. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't find the playing cards, and I just thought about that Alex uh, figurine I have. But, yeah, I yeah. do have a... I love this orange T-shirt. I mean, you were not going to get run over at night wearing that, are you? <laughs> no, look at that. It's very, yes, yes. Uh, uh, unless they're playing Hogs of the Night, of course. Hogs of the Road, <laughs> as yeah. they played in yeah. the early part of that film. Yeah. 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 But uh, no, I thank you so much for coming on here today and awesome. speaking with me. And um yeah, when this is ready, I'll send you the link and you can put it up wherever you want to. I, I appreciate that. Yeah. I'll put it up on the social media and on my website, yeah? Absolutely, absolutely. You, you got my full permission, absolutely. Um, before I let you go, uh, would you mind doing a plug for my show? Yes, of course I will. How do I do that? Just uh, state your name and say... Uh, that we're celebrating, of course, the 50th anniversary of A Clockwork Orange. And say you're listening to Greg Gilbert on Python's Paradise. Okay. Hi, I'm Carol Drinkwater. Um, I'm here on the show, Python's Paradise, being interviewed by lovely Greg Gilbert to celebrate 50 years of uh, the first screening of A Clockwork Orange, my first job out of drama school. Thanks, Greg. Absolutely. God bless you. Thank you so much for coming on here today. What an honor it was. Thank you, Greg, very much. Okay. You enjoy your day and enjoy France and keep yourself safe. And you, everybody keep safe. That's the main thing. Absolutely. You take care. Okay. Bye, Greg. Bye-bye. <laughs>